Ah, there we go. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing this morning? It's Monday, June first. It's nine a.m., and we have our first talk of the week for the SSL series number twenty-two. We have Bo Jacobs. Thank you for joining us today, Bo. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Joy. Hi, everyone. Bo and I know each other from Hiroshima. Uh, we've had many great discussions over the years, and in light of the recent news, I thought I've got to get Bo on. We've got to cover these topics. You're my wealth of knowledge on all things nuclear. Thank you for joining. Well, I'm really honored to be part of such an auspicious group as you've been lining up. So it's great for me to be here. Oh, thank you. It's great to hear that. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself briefly before we dive in? Yeah, sure. Um, my name is Bo Jacobs. Uh, I'm a historian, uh, trained as a historian of science and technology. I work as a professor at the Hiroshima Peace Institute and the Graduate School of Peace Studies at Hiroshima City University. Uh, I'm an American. I've been in Japan for 14 years, and I study the history of nuclear technologies. So the history of nuclear weapons, nuclear power, of radiation and radiation exposures. And a lot of my work has centered in the last eight or 10 years on what is called the global hibakusha. And these are people who have been exposed to radiation since 1945, primarily through nuclear testing, nuclear production, nuclear accidents, and things like this. Yeah, big, big topic. And uh, let's dive right in. The latest news, uh, kind of Washington Post was covering, saying Trump officials have talked about resuming nuclear testing. Here's why that would hurt the U.S. Um, is this recent news, is it really like a game changer in terms of how uh, countries have been doing testing or not been doing testing? Could you comment on that? Yeah, it would be a game changer if it was done. Um, like a lot of things with the Trump administration, he says a lot of things that once he says them, they go nowhere. Um, so we'll, we'll find out. But if the U.S. was to resume testing nuclear weapons, it would be a dramatic game changer. Um, the U.S. has not tested weapons. Basically, none of the large countries have tested nuclear weapons since the end of the Cold War, except France. And uh, France hasn't tested weapons in over 20 years. The only people testing weapons at all now are North Korea has been testing weapons a little bit. Um, and so if the United States were to begin testing nuclear weapons, it's very likely that Russia would, China would, uh, and you might find yourself in a spiral, in another arms race spiral, because the only reason to test nuclear weapons is to test new designs. So if countries start testing nuclear weapons, that's an indicator that countries are interested in building additional nuclear weapons and perhaps new design nuclear weapons. So that would clearly be destabilizing politically. And also it would increase the risk to all of us from nuclear weapons, a risk which we all live with today, even though we really don't think about it too often. So it would be extremely, it would be extremely bad news and there would be very little good that would come out of it. Um, right now, we're very aware that our nuclear weapons work fine. We've got thousands and thousands and thousands of them. There's really nothing we're going to gain by by building new nuclear weapons. I personally uh, have think nuclear weapons are uh, should be illegal, uh, and that nuclear there is no purpose for nuclear weapons. But even if you were to argue that there is a purpose for nuclear weapons, we have them. They work. We really don't need to begin to escalate from from where we're at. Yeah, and I think one of the recent three months ago, oh my gosh, seems like the world has really changed since then, but we had a great talk at the A-bombed warehouses three yeah. months ago. And one of my like biggest takeaways from that talk was how nuclear testing affects all of us. It's not just yeah. one isolated area. The, the yeah. whole ecosystem around the world has changed with every test. Absolutely, especially the large hydrogen bomb tests in the 1950s, which distributed radiation all around the world. Uh, radiation, uh, just, just to give you an idea, there, there's, there's radioactivity from nuclear testing all around the world. So in Nagasaki, there was a study a few years ago in Nagasaki, it found that there was more radiation present in the soil in Nagasaki 
from global nuclear testing than there was from the nuclear attack on Nagasaki. Uh, so it's, it, we, we use, and we use nuclear, we use the fact that ra this radiation is distributed globally for all kinds of purposes. Uh, the fact that there was so much radiation distributed has helped us in the past to understand how the ocean currents work because there was so much radiation in the ocean that we could trace the movement of ocean currents globally, uh, how the atmosphere works, how, think, how the various different dynamics of the atmosphere function as a whole system. We've been able to trace that because we put so much radioactivity in the atmosphere that we could watch the background dynamics by tracing the radiation. That's crazy. And I think one, on of the, of one of the examples you gave at the warehouses was about uh, dating paintings. Right. You can we, we use radiation to detect all kinds of forgeries. Paintings is one of them. So, for example, if somebody was to say today, oh, look, I have a Van Gogh painting that nobody knew about. Well, we could find out if that painting was painted after 1945 because the threads in the canvas and the paint would have traces of radiation in them if they were if that was painted after 1945. Uh, we've used this to detect forgeries of wine wine put into old bottles that's new wine and being sell, sold as wine that was 100 years old. And so everything since 1945, including our bodies, has traces of radiation in it from nuclear testing. The distribution was global. And even in the 1950s, the United States did a secret study uh, called Project Sunshine, where they gathered teeth and bones from over 20,000 human bodies, including cadavers, around the world, from all around the world, and they found traces of radiation in all of them, including people who lived in the southern tip of South America, a continent which never had nuclear testing. So we live, we live now with all of this radiation. Uh, it's, it's, it's traceable anywhere in the world. And so if testing was resumed, it would be a higher percentage in all of our bodies, in all of our, like even Galapagos well, has traces of nuclear tests, right? Galapagos does, of course, every place does. But if we were to resume nuclear testing, it would likely be underground. Okay. So the, distri the distribution globally came from testing in the atmosphere. Uh, the US, the Soviet Union and the UK stopped testing in the atmosphere in 1963. France and China in the 70s and 80s. Um, so if, if the tests were underground, there wouldn't be that global distribution. There would be the same release of radiation, but the radiation would be contained much closer at hand and on, uh, uh, you know, at the test sites. So that does contain it more. Right. It's still released into the ecosystem mm -hmm. and it still will migrate through the ecosystem, but it won't have the global distribution of atmospheric testing, which brought particles up into the upper atmosphere so they could circle the earth and deposit. Right. Um, looking at the Washington Post article, the main picture is a mushroom cloud with ships below right. during yeah. Operation Crossroads at the Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands in 1946. Yeah. Now the war has just ended. Yeah. What was this is the less purpose? Than a, yeah. This was less than a year after Hiroshima. It yeah. wasn't even a year since the a nuclear attack on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The U.S. was testing nuclear weapons in the Marshall Islands. Um, this particular test, these, the two tests that were done in the Marshall Islands, um, there's a couple of different reasons that they were doing it. But for example, here, one of the questions that the U.S. military had was, if you attack a naval port with a nuclear weapon, would you be able to render all of the Navy ships useless? So the U.S. government towed over 70 Navy ships from World War II, Japanese ships, American ships, even ships from the Atlantic, German oh. and British ships that had been damaged that were no longer being used. And they put 70 ships or 71, I forget the exact number, in Bikini Atoll, in the lagoon in Bikini Atoll. Mm -hmm. And they detonated first a weapon in the air, like had been done here and in Nagasaki, and then second, a weapon underwater. And the idea was to find out if you could destroy all of those ships or if any of those ships would be usable afterwards. And they were not usable afterwards. They were all so radioactive that they they could not be used. Wow. So in the picture, you see the mushroom cloud and then you see all these ships around. Were, yeah. were people, uh, damn it, I mean, were people affected by this test? 
Absolutely. There, there were no people on those ships, but there were lots of goats and pigs and monkeys and mice and other animals were on those actual ships. But there were 40,000 U.S. troops. They were on boats outside of the lagoon at the time of the test. And then they came in to check on the well-being of the animals, to measure the radiation on the boats, to see if they could scrub the radiation off the boats. And what happened there at the second test, the weapon was underwater. So the fallout that would have gone up in a cloud and distributed, it all came back down because it was the cloud was heavy with water. So all of the fallout stayed in the lagoon. And as those boats sat there, they got more and more and more radioactive every day. So thousands of U.S. troops who were working on those boats doing reconnaissance were getting more and more radiation. And eventually, in a panic, the U.S. had to evacuate 40,000 troops and get them all out of there because the troops were being exposed to so much radiation. Wow. Did, and as is, a secondary, there, is data released on how many people were affected and got sick, or is that top secret? No, the U.S. doesn't track the data of the uh, illnesses of its own soldiers. Uh, hundreds, over 200 to 300,000 U.S. troops took part in U.S. nuclear testing, and the U.S. did not track their health. Uh, and did not keep records of which soldiers were participating in the test. So the National Association of Atomic Veterans in the United States, they advocate on behalf of these veterans um, in order to even make a case for any kind of compensation, you have to prove that you took part in a test because the government has no record that you did. So you had to keep paperwork from your participation. Wow. It's and as like, an aside, yeah. the, the U.S. really wanted to know if you could decontaminate these boats once they became really radioactive. So one of the things that they did was they towed a whole bunch of them to San Francisco and they anchored them off of San Francisco and one by one, they brought them into two Navy shipyards inside San Francisco Bay. One of them was Hunter's Point and they tried to decontaminate the ships there. They, they sprayed them with acid, they, uh, did all kinds of sandblasting to try to get the radiation off of these boats. None of that was successful, but they did spread radiation all over the shipyard. So these two places are still Superfund sites in the United States that have ongoing contamination that the, that the Navy has basically left in place in San Francisco. And then it took those boats and sunk them by the Farallon Islands, which is a nature preserve off of oh. San Francisco itself. So. So the U.S. brought this contamination back inside the United States into San Francisco, where it remains a problem. I've I've heard that in Japan as well with um, the radioactive debris that it mm -hmm. was being moved around Japan. Is that to kind of spread the radiation? And then if cancer rates go up, it's not one specific area. Is that tactical? Are you are you talking about Fukushima? Uh huh. This is part. This is what people say. There's no. I don't know that there's direct evidence of this as a strategy, but it's. But it is an effective strategy, whether it's intentional or not. If you take some of the waste, or if you burn the debris in all of the prefectures instead of burning when you when you burn the debris up in Fukushima, you know a lot of the ash that's resultant from that is highly radioactive and collects the radiation. Um, and, and so that's radioactive waste. If you burn it in a bunch of prefectures, then you distribute that. Uh, you don't collect that burden in one place, but you also distribute the radiation so that the levels of radiation are less noticeably higher in Fukushima than they are in the rest of Japan. So that's an outcome of that strategy, whether it was intentionally done in order to make it uh, make it seem more normal. That's there's no direct evidence of, but whether you have direct evidence of that or not, the strategy would have that outcome. Right. So if I mean, in in a global sense, if testing was resumed, it's like moving the exposure everywhere again. Right. Or but you said well, it'd be underground, so it'd be yeah. more contained. It would be more contained at the site, but it would you would have increased production and production of materials for nuclear weapons is one dramatic source of contamination in a variety of different places. In the United States, there were hundreds of sites involved in the production of nuclear weapons, you know, many of them 
are places where there's cancer clusters and places where there's ongoing health problems in communities. So simply putting back into gear the wide uh, process of production um, to make nuclear weapons would would endanger people in a wide variety of places. Wow. Um, let's, from our last talk at the warehouses, I think we, we covered a lot of really interesting topics. And just being at the warehouses itself, the reason we chose to be there is because they're thinking about um, getting rid of those and just making it a part of new modern Hiroshima. And we were, we were talking about the value of like historical buildings like that. You must have seen this kind of uh, place around the world. Your website has a lot of yeah. great pictures and this is important reminder, isn't it? Like the Peace Parks, a bomb dome kind of thing. Well, you know, the, the, physical, the physical structures that were part of historical processes really can viscerally bring us back to those moments more than a, more than a curated display can or, you know, uh, I mean, there, there's obviously a lot of power to a museum or to a commemorative site, but um, there's something there's something about, you know, for example, some of some of the photos there are of the instrumentation bunkers in Kazakhstan at the nuclear test site in Kazakhstan, uh, some of the leftover material from British nuclear testing on Christmas Island in the Pacific. And there's something about the physical presence of the items of that time, uh, even even things that are not usable, that just evoke that moment and evoke that history in, in a really, in a way that you, that you can feel. Um, here in Hiroshima, there's so few old buildings inside the city center, and those warehouses are wonderful. I mean, they're wonderful. I mean, outside of the fact that they're a historical testimony, there's few things that evoke that sort of beauty of an old building even inside the city because the destruction was so widespread. Um, and so it's, I think that here it's, it's essential, especially something that would have so many potential uses that's really intact. Um, but th there's something about, there's something about walking in the place where things happened that, that makes them real to you. Um, and there's something about physical remains. I mean, we go down to the Peace Park, those of us here in Hiroshima, we all go down to the Peace Park, but there's something about the A-bomb dome that's different than the rest of the Peace Park because it's not, it's not curated, it's not created for us, it's preserved as it was. And that's that speaks to us in a way that none of the memorialization can speak to us. Have you been to Fukushima? Do they have a yeah. memorial site like... No. Peace Park or Ibam Dome. I know they're trying to increase yeah. tourism again. I mean, tourism as a whole all over the world is now stopped. Right. Yeah. Um, from mm -hmm. your website, you've got the middle school at Nagasaki, the destruction just yeah. after the bomb. Um, yeah. Nagasaki, of course, has a peace memorial park. Um, right. I, did, I visited and I didn't see many of these uh, relics like the warehouse where the building is as is. Right. Have it's you? I mean, in, in Nagasaki, you know, the weapon was detonated in a valley, you know, not not near downtown. And so the physical destruction was contained a little bit by the walls, the mountain walls of the valley. So you don't have this broad area that was affected the way you do in Hiroshima. And within that valley, things were fairly well destroyed. Uh, so but in contrast to Hiroshima, the, the park in Nagasaki is built around Ground Zero. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ground Zero is a really tangible place in the Nagasaki Park. Whereas here in Hiroshima, as you know, it um, most people have no idea where Ground Zero is. And right. tourists rarely find Ground Zero. Uh, There's just a little plaque. It's one block over from Peace Park. And yeah. often it has cars parked in front of it. And it's a, yeah. it's a functioning office building. So I, I think yeah. people want to find it. And Absolutely. I don't know why that wasn't included in the Peace Park facility because people want to see it, right? Well, it was the design of the park was that it, it used, I forget, what's the name of that old neighborhood? Is it, uh, um, I, forget, I forget the name. But anyways, the park, the, 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 the A-bomb dome is not technically in the park. It's right. outside of the park. Right. Um, 
So it, it just wasn't physically in a convenient place. Um, but you would think there would still be more more marking of it because that marker, as you say, there's just a marker there. That's the same marker that's at you know dozens of sites around town that are a bomb sites, just commemorating the specific thing about that location. There's you know there's one in front of City Hall talking about City Hall. There's one in front of the uh, Chigoku Electric Building, you know, talking about what happened there. So it's just kind of a very common marker. Yeah. Um, and, and it's a, it's a little bit strange yeah. in that way, but I think yeah, it was completely I, in some out. parts they've done it really well in Hiroshima yeah. City, like around yeah. the castle, for example. Yeah. They'll yeah. show the picture just after destruction, and then right. you're looking at the rebuilt version, so you yeah. get that sense of what the disaster was like and the sense of Absolutely. place, right? And some of those brown markers, they have, they do have those images, you know, where they'll show a bridge and what it looked like then. And there behind you is the bridge now. And, you know, it, so uh, some of the commemoration here is really done very well. Yeah. Um, and there, it's just, I, I know I've run into a lot of people visiting the town who, who ask where Ground Zero is. Or if I say, would you like to see Ground Zero? They just assume the A-bomb dome was Ground Zero. Right. Yeah. Well, often it, on, on Google Maps, it's it's mislabeled. You're yeah. at the Ibam Dominant and people will write, this is ground zero, not realizing you're actually a, a block away. I, I live in Hiroshima. I didn't realize for years, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, though, even those of us who live here, you know, it's it's just kind of hidden. Yeah. And you can, it's funny because you, you tend not to look at it this way, but you can experience, experientially, you can look at the dome and you can see the angle of where the bomb was because of how the destruction of the dome is. You can see that it was off to the east and uh, because the east side of the dome has destruction a little more intense than the west side of the dome. So even looking at the building, you get you can get that idea. But uh, yeah, even for those of us who live in Hiroshima, it, it's not necessarily well-known yeah. where ground zero is yeah um from your website you've got like a rusty square bunker maybe and it looks like behind is maybe one of the islands is that marshall islands or no that's christmas island okay in the in the nation of kiribati uh which is written kiribati but pronounced kiribati by the locals and this was a location for h-bomb testing for the british and for the americans um, the Americans stopped testing in the Marshall Islands in 1958, but they did con want to continue to test hydrogen bombs. Um, the British were testing in Australia, but Australia would not let them test hydrogen bombs in Australia, so they needed another location. They ended up testing hydrogen bombs on Christmas Island in the mid-Pacific, and that that picture is the that's the old British base on Christmas Island, which is now the only hotel that's available to stay in on wow. Christmas Island. And there's still a lot of just leftover material from the British Army base that's still there, even like sitting, that's literally sitting on the grounds of the hotel. Wow. Um, Did any locals get compensation for being affected by the radiation or? No, no. absolutely not. The British soldiers barely have received any compensation at all. The locals were not even given very much information about the, it's a very remote place. Christmas Island is a place, there was never television on Christmas Island. You know, it's it's an extremely remote place. And where, so- Where is it? In the Pacific? It's in the mid Pacific. Mm -hmm. It's, I, I don't know, it's it's south of Hawaii, mm -hmm. but it's almost, it, it's, and it's also a little bit west of Hawaii, but not far. It's really in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, and it's in Kiribati. Is, Kiribati is, like a lot of Pacific Island nations, a huge, vast area with a, some tiny, tiny bits of land. And most of the people in Kiribati don't live on Christmas Island. Christmas Island has a couple thousand people living there. Christmas Island, in, 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 to give you a sense, uh, in, in history, the Polynesians came through there planted coconuts there, but they didn't stay because it's not oh. a very habitable place. Okay, so people, wow. People didn't live there until uh, a little over 100 years ago when they were brought there for copra production. So it's it's kind of, it's not the most welcoming place and it's remained very, very remote. So I was told by some of the elders there who were children at the time of the testing that they, they had not been given any information about how many tests had happened, 
what the tests were like and what the legacy's effects were. And she, the head of this group told me that in 19, I think it was 1996, uh, I forget the exact year, but the BBC came with several soldiers, British soldiers. The British soldiers have a very active group asking for a medal and compensation and recognition for their service and also for the health effects that they've suffered, much like the soldiers in other nuclear testing nations. And several of them, they were doing a story about them and what happened on Christmas Island and the health problems they've had since. And so the BBC took them to Christmas Island to revisit it and to film there for a documentary they were making. And this woman told me that one of the soldiers said to her, yeah, we have cancer from those nuclear tests and probably people here do too. And she said that was the first anybody there had heard mm -hmm. that there was a link between cancer and these tests when they were children. Um, so there's no compensation for them at all. Wow. And uh, the middle picture you've got, it looks like maybe an underground uh, facility. And this is the, the air vents on the top, the concrete. That's uh, instrumentation bunkers at the nuclear test site in Kazakhstan, mm -hmm. the, the primary nuclear test site of the former Soviet Union. There were almost 500 nuclear tests conducted, most of them in the atmosphere, uh, in outside of a town called Semipolitinsk. Um, now in independent Kazakhstan, it's renamed as Semi. But inside those concrete bunkers that you see there, you can see the windows there. There were instruments and cameras in order to measure and document nuclear explosions. So those are out on part of the, uh, you know, on the test site uh, area in Kazakhstan. And then there's an underground facility in the middle? Yeah, as, as you know, one of the giant challenges facing us as a as a species as a civilization is all of the spent nuclear fuel mm -hmm. um, in a nuclear power plant you know a nuclear power plant runs by fuel rods the energy comes from fuel rods uh, nuclear fuel rods are primarily uranium there's some plutonium and other chemicals as they're as they're spent as they're uh, as they're used up they're used for three years they're burned for three years in a power plant then they're taken out so there's uh, tens of thousands of tons of this material, and it needs to be contained for 100,000 years or more. It will remain dangerous for well over 100,000 years. So this is a challenge facing every country that has nuclear power or nuclear weapons is how to store their spent fuel. And one of the only ideas, functional ideas that we have is to bury it underground, bury it half a kilometer underground. And so that underground site that you see, this is a underground site for burying nuclear waste. It's a test site in Sweden. Sweden is now building the one where they will put the waste. Finland is also building this same thing. So that's that tunnel you see is half a kilometer underground. And it's essentially working out the technology of how to put nuclear fuel. Sorry, I just need to go. Go ahead. It's, it's, uh, it's working out the technology of how to bury the nuclear fuel in theory in a way that will contain the radiation uh, for 100,000 years. So, wow. um, and, and then here in Japan, here here in Japan, Japan way, mm -hmm. we have a, a large, you know, we have over 50 nuclear power plants that have operated for decades. We have a large amount of nuclear fuel, of spent nuclear fuel. These places in Sweden and in Finland, in theory, they've been geologically inert for a billion years, so nothing's going to happen to them. That's a debatable point. But here in Japan, there is no place like that. Japan is is full of earthquakes, earthquake faults. It's a volcanic zone. There is no place a half a kilometer underground that we can be confident will be unmoved and unchanged for a hundred thousand years. So weren't they freezing freezing one of the facilities and? There was something in Fukushima, and I think we talked about it in a previous talk, and one of the things you'd seen in Chernobyl, was it? It was that they covered it in a concrete dome, but then yes. you said even if you do that, you've got it going into the groundwater. Yeah, you, you have the, the, core, the core of the reactor at Chernobyl. Some of it was distributed in an explosion, but the rest of it melted down under the building. At Fukushima, you have three full meltdowns. So you have the core, which is tons and tons of material. Mm 
uh, the, all the, the former fuel rods, it's all melted in a mass, in a molten mass underneath the buildings of three buildings in Fukushima. So in Chernobyl, there's a containment dome over the building to keep radiation from being released into the atmosphere. But the melted core is still underneath that building. It's, it's over 30 years and they haven't been able to remove it yet. The, the buildings in Fukushima, um, nobody, no human being can enter those three buildings. Still. Where the melted fuel is, it, 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 wow. the re- levels of radiation would kill a person in minutes. And so it's going to be 50 years at the best before we're able to remove that material underneath there. So even at Chernobyl, containing these things just means keeping there from being releases into the atmosphere, but actually removing the molten fuel is going to be, you know, it's, it's going to take centuries to really clean these sites up. And in Fukushima, um, it's a, it's a watershed. So where those cores are underneath the buildings, there's water flowing through there underground every day. And part of the strategy to keep that from carrying radiation into the sea was to build an ice wall before the plant so that the water goes around and doesn't come across those uh, that melted fuel. But that did not work at all. Yeah, that seems, I mean, there's so many parallels, I think, with what we talk about with the problems with nuclear waste, with nuclear radiation, with testing, and coronavirus. These are, these are problems you cannot see, but Absolutely. you know they're dangerous, right? Absolutely. And, you know, currently I'm finishing up on a book and this is and the the COVID situation, the coronavirus situation has really given me a tool for analyzing one aspect. There's this way you've seen this certainly with Fukushima. There's this way that when people are really worried about radiation, people who live in an area where they're now. Now, what happened in Fukushima, the reason people are at risk is that there were explosions and these clouds carry radioactive particles up into the air and then just like a mushroom cloud they drift and those particles come down so those particles can remain dangerous for different periods of time depending on their chemical nature cesium-137 which is a big problem at chernobyl and a big problem at fukushima will remain dangerous for over 300 years and it's also extremely good at migrating through an ecosystem at moving into plants at moving with water so it it integrates itself into an ecosystem pretty quickly um no matter what the back no matter what level of radiation is that you measure with a geiger counter you get one particle inside of your body that particle can lodge inside of your body and do a lot of damage and cause disease so it doesn't really matter what the levels of radiation are so much as it matters how much what the density of the particles in the ecosystem are. So once they fall in a place like Fukushima, they're integrated into the ecosystem now. So a lot of people are worried about the health of their children because children become much more affected by radiation because their bodies are growing rapidly. Um, and if you, this is why s- schools don't have outdoor play or children aren't walking in the forest uh, because there's all of these particles there. Well, a lot of people can be anxious about that. That that seems to me to be a healthy response to finding yourself in that situation is to be anxious and worried about your health and the health of the people you love. And they get generally, when it comes to things like radiation, people get dismissed as being irrational. They have irrational fear of radiation. They're obsessed with it or they're, um, they call it radiophobia, an, an, uh, uh, an irrational fear of radiation. Well, that that to me is an industry spin and one of the ways to understand that is that we all feel the same way about coronavirus right it's out there we don't know exactly where it is it's a risk to us and our families we want to protect ourselves from it that's considered rational behavior right we're all encouraged to do that we're all encouraged to avoid touching things wash your hands be aware that there's yeah wear a mask be aware that there's danger try to reduce the risk to yourself this is this similar, it's just a, a, almost a perfect uh, analogy for what people living in an area where fallout comes down and an area where there's a lot of radioactive particles in the ecosystem, they too need to protect themselves. They need to be aware of the risks, but we ridicule them. These people are ridiculed as they're crazy, they're obsessed with radiation, and that's a re-victimization of people. Yeah. I mean, if you if you live somewhere and suddenly there's an industrial accident and there's toxic danger to you and your family around, 
worrying is the right thing to do. Yeah. It's not crazy. It's not irrational. What do you say, um, President Trump's only logical person in the room, Dr. Fauci, said, um, I want to err on the side of caution. I, yeah. I want to be the one who everybody says is overreacting because the opposite is a lot more damaging. Yeah, absolutely right. And this is even doubly so for those of us that are parents because your burden to protect your child is, is a fundamental part of who you are. So being cavalier about your child's health, that, that, that's kind of nutty. Being vigilant about your child's health, that makes way more sense. As, as Fauci said, all parents would rather err on the side of keeping their child safe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's uh, transition a little bit. Talk about some of the yeah. books that you've written. Um, you bet. Dragon Tail in English and Japanese. Uh, yeah. Do you want to, is there anything, it's, it's 2010 you wrote it, yeah. but any, any of your ideas still relevant now if people are interested? Yeah, and it, it really is, if you're, especially if you're trying to wrap your head around nuclear issues, um, essentially that's a look at uh, nuclear representation in culture in the early Cold War in the United States. So basically what that means is how people learn to think about what a nuclear weapon is, uh, what nuclear power is, what radiation is, what radiation does, who would survive a nuclear war. So these are foundational to the way we think about nuclear things. Um, this is so it's a study of the origin of how we learn to grasp what nuclear things are nuclear things are very hard to understand You know, they're they're not ex, they're not instinctive like how is there all this energy in an atom? How am I at risk because there was radiation in the area? What will radiation do and so? the the way both that this got explained to people by the government and then the way that culture then sort of represented this and repurposed some of these things uh, they're a part of how we understand nuclear things now. I mean, for example, nuclear things are always accompanied by a little bit of a sense of the magical. Mm -hmm. You know, nu nuclear things are, uh, you know, if in, in, in the 1950s in a movie, if you have some kind of monster of any sort, you don't really have to explain it as long as you have a Geiger counter going click, 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 click. Right. Now we know anything's possible. And so if you want to understand why nuclear things have the sort of patina that they do, why they have the cultural impact that they do. That's really what that book looks at, um, how we learned to think about nuclear things. Wow, great. And still, yes, very relevant. And you can see how the spin of nuclear weapons, nuclear energy is very significant in terms of climate crisis, in terms of coronavirus, you know, how it, it favors what the politicians want to do in the short term. I think last last time we talked, we talked a lot about politicians are very good at short term thinking, <laughs> not Absolutely. really long term. Yeah. Well, for example, with making nuclear waste with no way to to manage the waste, that's long been described as building a building that has no bathrooms and just figuring, oh, we'll figure out later how that works. It, it's pretty short term thinking. That's a good analogy. You, you're going to need a bathroom sometime. Well, all of us are generating waste, and it's yes. better to have that waste managed well. Yes. So without a plan, let's stop using it. Um, yeah. And the, as you can see, our plan with the waste now is basically sweep it under the rug. Just make sure the rug is half a kilometer deep. Yeah. Even that is not possible in some places, and that doesn't sound like a great solution. Um, yeah. Your your next book, filling the hole in the nuclear future, is is art about art. Yeah, art and popular culture responding to the bomb. So it's a mixture of uh, scholarship about art and popular culture, and also some art presented photography, manga, um, installation art. So it's basically about how artists have responded to the bomb, the ways that they've engaged uh, with it. And uh, it includes, for example, there's there's a wonderful film um, made by a Hiroshima animator. He, he lives in Osaka, um, and it's uh, and it's called uh, wait, what's it, what's the I forget the English translation of the name. Um, well, anyways, it's the story of his father. It's the story of his father who was five years old uh, and lived in the Yokogawa area at the time of the nuclear attack. <clears throat> 
and it's beautiful animation. It's 17 minutes long, and the first 14 minutes or so are his father and his friends playing in the neighborhood. And then at about 14 minutes into it, the bomb goes off, and he's very purposely not made it graphic because he remembers going to the museum and seeing really scary images when he was very young and he didn't want to do that. So it's not particularly graphic when the bomb goes off. And then you see his father put in a truck and driven off to the countryside and that's it. So that's that uh, anime is in manga form in the book. And then very fascinatingly, his sister wrote a very big manga about their family arguing about the making of that film when her brother was making the film. Oh, wow. That the, the father was like, why are you making a film about me playing with my friends? It should be about how terrible the bomb is. It should be about the horror of nuclear weapons. And so it's, to, for me, that's fascinating because this is very much a piece of art about being second generation, about inheriting this history. And so for him, what Maeda-san told me, the person who made the, the anime, he said that to him, this was the day that his father wasn't able to be a child anymore and now had to be a hibaksha and a survivor. And so he gave his father 14 minutes of childhood back. And and his father didn't get that that mattered, that seemed dumb to his father. But to him, it was precious. And right. so this grappling inside a family with how this history is inherited, how this history has meaning um so so th this there's there is p uh, then a piece of that manga is also in the book um and so it's a it's essentially about how artists have tried to grapple with these issues that's so interesting and that brings up so many issues of stigma like we've talked mm -hmm. about before and also yeah. people with coronavirus in japan or anywhere are also yeah. struggling with stigma even if you go and get a test i think rochelle cop was talking about this yeah. even the pressure to get a test or not get a test because of stigma so this is something we definitely understand from hiroshima nagasaki and anybody who's been around radiation would understand right absolutely we human beings have very uh visceral reactions to things and one of the most deeply held things that we're worried about is contamination and so people are repulsed by the notion of of some sort of contamination risk to themselves and people who they believe are contaminated are treated you know as pariahs or uh and certainly that's been a part of the history of this city it's a part of the history of all of the test sites and places in the chernobyl zone places where there's been accidents we've certainly seen that in fukushima it's certainly true with uh with disease and and a pandemic when people are afraid so you bet these things stretch across culture and time but then in america now we're seeing like an anti-mask wearing anti-stay-at-home irrational behavior yes. and that is really hard for me to explain but it's kind of yeah. like an entitlement like i'm not going to get sick right it's it's just embedded in the crazy politics that are happening in america oh. right now um where it you know as you know there's a lot of anti-science uh and uh so people people can use this as a way to attack their enemies and that's what's been going on in america um, it's crazy. It, yeah. It's really, really, uh, uh, it, we, we could talk for hours about what's going oh, yes. on in America, especially oh, yes. today in the last few days. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, let's, let's talk about your next book, Images of Rupture Between East and West. Yeah. Yeah, this is a, this was a, a collective work. It came out of a conference and this is basically about, uh, Eastern European art and literature. So uh, clearly one of the things that I've been really interested in is representation and how these things are understood and presented. Um, and this looks at both the Holocaust and the nuclear attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and how they've been interpreted in Eastern European art and literature. Uh, Eastern Europe, of course, essentially the location of the Holocaust. That's where most of it was carried out. No, there weren't really concentration camps in Germany. Or there was one or two, but... Um, so it so this is just a, a series of fascinating articles about how uh, Hiro, about how Hiroshima and the way that the nuclear attacks in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Eastern Europe during the period of the Soviet bloc, in many ways, the way that Hiroshima and Nagasaki were presented was as the 
uh, violence of American imperialism. So had nothing to do with Japanese people, really had nothing to do with Hiroshima or Nagasaki, but was a means of attacking America. Um, and so this book just looks at, at that and also why, the wide ranges in which Holocaust, the, the history of the Holocaust has been dealt with in Eastern Europe. Okay. And um, reimagining Hiroshima and Nagasaki, nuclear humanities in the post-Cold War, War, Cold War? Yes, it's, it's interesting because since the Cold War ended, there's really been a shift in scholarship around nuclear issues um, and in the way Hiroshima and Nagasaki are understood, in also in the way that popular culture and art has responded. So, for example, during the Cold War, most of the art and popular culture had to do with nuclear weapons, nuclear war, radiation. But since the Cold War ended, most of the artists working on nuclear issues are working on issues of nuclear waste. Uh, this is what remains to us, in a sense. And so um, this is this is looking at the way that thinking about Hiroshima has changed since the Cold War and how the scholarship has changed. So, for example, during the Cold War, a lot of the scholarship focused on the threat of nuclear war, the face-off between the Soviet Union and the United States, what the lessons of Hiroshima are. But after the Cold War ended, scholarship became much, much more diverse and fascinating. And all kinds of, there's been a lot of looks at how uh, gender issues in relation to nuclear weapons, women's roles, men's roles, uh, racialized aspects of it. Um, so it it's become more like, other historical issues and less uh, at first it was Hiroshima and Nagasaki were always a warning to us about how we had to fix the future. Um, there's tons of books in, in the 1980s, nuclear scholarship books, where the authors say, hopefully this book will help wake people up and we can avoid having a nuclear war. It's really unusual for scholarship to say that hopefully we can save the world. You know, scholarship is typically fairly analytical about things. And after the Cold War ended, Hiroshima and Nagasaki became, for scholars and artists, less of a warning about what might come and rather something that happened and something that can tell us a lot about the time that it happened. And uh, so this is just looking at the shift in scholarship by uh, many different people. That's interesting. And the Washington Post article is mentioning about um, this is a big shift if they start testing again because it'll it'll be the first time after the Cold War and it'll start up whole new problems, right, on many yes. levels. Yes, and, and that's, that's the thing. It's easy, it's easy to take a look at that Washington Post article and think, oh, Trump is crazy or he's macho and he, you know, he wants big weapons and but there's something much more insidious happening which is that during the cold war there was a massive economy behind nuclear weapons and the people who oversaw that and the people who strategized the people who came up with what weapons we should develop how to use those weapons they were at the top of the national security bureaucracy in the united states and since the cold war they've become unimportant people and they would like things to go back to the way they were they want a lot of funding, they want to be important, they want to drive the conversation and the strategy and the foreign policy of the United States. So they've been trying to start nuclear, restart nuclear testing for decades, but with Trump, they have possibly a sympathetic ear. Um, so for me, I've always seen the Cold War primarily as a war by the US government against the US people and the Soviet government against the Soviet people, both countries bankrupted themselves. This is why the U.S. is in the state it's in now, because while we were the richest country in the world, we spent that money on weapons. Um, that's why we don't have health care. That's why we don't have good access to education or secure retirement. And th this economy, it shifted. It's still, very, it's still a very military economy in the United States, but the nuclear strategy people, the nuclear military people, they want to be back on top again. And you can you can see a little bit of of how this is reflected in what's going on now in america for example with the riots that are going on in the last week in, in the last couple of days in america one of the points that many people make is gosh look at the way that every cop has this unbelievable amount of equipment and is 
you know, like RoboCop or like, you know, one of the Avengers and they have these trucks and they have all of this material. But yet the people that are actually saving our lives in the hospitals are wearing plastic garbage bags in order to protect themselves. So this is a funding choice. This yeah. is a funding choice we've made in the United States since 9-11. But also a big contrast is I just read, uh, I think it was Washington Post saying that all the training of the police to have better consciousness of black white issues and bias was cut so yes. they've they've got all the equipment they've got all the guns but none of the yeah. training which actually makes more difference well as we there's a lot of people who uh, have returned from fighting in the US military from Iraq and Afghanistan and said that these kinds of behaviors would never be allowed in a war zone where you just go walking down the street, pushing people down, shooting things at people and, you know, and pepper macing people that that that's not acceptable behavior in a war zone. And so you have because of the massive distrib the massive production of this military equipment, it's, you know, it just gets given to police departments afterwards, but they're not trained in how to use this equipment. And there's also no accountability when it's misused. Right. And. That's and huge, so there's there's a similar problem. logic behind going into nuclear testing, which is let's get the money tap opened again. Let's get these, you know, military facilities and uh, think tanks funded in a big way. And it's very much about money and power more than it is about the practical need for these weapons. And I think that transitions well into your most recent work about born violent, about yeah. nuclear power. Do you want to introduce that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. This is this is a description of the origin of nuclear power. You know, the sort of social myth that we have is that nuclear weapons were invented, they were used, then we decided, let's find a good use for this, the peaceful atom, let's use this to benefit human beings, and so we made nuclear power. And you can debate whether nuclear power is good or bad, but that's the story of how we got nuclear power usually. But the truth is that nuclear power plants were invented before nuclear weapons. Nuclear power plants are essential part of producing nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons, you can make them without a nuclear power plant, but we didn't, and countries don't do it. The, what nuclear power plants were invented for was to manufacture plutonium. They're a way to manufacture plutonium. So the first nuclear power plants were operational in the United States in 1944 <clears throat> to produce the plutonium that was used in the nuclear weapon in Nagasaki and in all of the nuclear weapons since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The Hiroshima bomb was the only bomb ever built that didn't use plutonium. Um, so nuclear power plants were, were operating for a decade on Earth before they were ever used to create electricity for, uh, for public use. Um, in the United States, when we, when we built our first nuclear power plant for electricity, which was in Shippingport, Pennsylvania, uh, it was the 14th nuclear power plant in the United States. We already had 13 nuclear power plants operating, just producing plutonium for nuclear weapons. So nuclear power plants were born violent. They were born to kill people. They were invented to kill people, and they were used to kill people. And so that, that history is built into these things. Here in, in Japan, uh, Rokusho, the... The fuel reprocessing plant was just okayed, I think it was yesterday, or, or the news came yesterday that it was okayed. And and what this is, is a way to manuf a way to take the spent nuclear fuel from the Japanese nuclear power plants that have operated and manufacture plutonium from them. There's already tons of plutonium in Japan from reprocessing the, the fuel rods to take out the plutonium uh, and this, this technology has always been about producing plutonium. It's either directly what it's used for, or it's a side thing that it's used for. Um, and it, that's, that's what they are. Wow. Yeah. In, in terms of sustainability, people argue that uh, nuclear is a cleaner option, and it should be considered a nuclear uh, renewable energy. But I don't think so. Not if you look at how the source material is mined and shipped and used and then what happens after like we really in the modern age when you're talking sustainability you have to look at the closed loop you have to look at the yeah. circular from birth to death and hopefully we can choose more things which is not birth to death or 
cradle to grave, but reused over and over. And there is no way nuclear power can do that. Well, we're currently looking at, you know, two to three decades from from commitment to nuclear power plants being built and generating electricity. So they're they're not going to come to the rescue in any kind of a quick way, first yeah, of all. Yeah. Uh, second of all, the you know, the uh, carbon footprint of uranium mining is significant. The carbon footprint of milling uranium into uh, manufacturing it into fuel rods, it's significant. And the carbon footprint of storing spent nuclear fuel for 100,000 years, we really have no idea what that is at all. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Crazy. Um, so it, yeah. it seems to me that the only way we're going to sustainably have an ongoing uh, energy source for society is a renewable source uh, and and certainly one that doesn't require building gigantic underground facilities to store in Sweden and, and Norway or Finland where they're building these underground things they, it, no, Sweden has nine or oh no 12 nuclear power plants you know Finland has six nuclear power plants you know there's countries with a hundred nuclear power plants the amount of waste that they have plus the amount of waste from manufacturing a thousand uh, you know 20, 000, or in the U.S. or Soviet Union, 60 or 70,000 nuclear weapons, all the spent fuel from that. There's just, we can't even imagine the, you, you take a look at when there's an accident at a place like Fukushima and the carbon footprint that's gone into remediating that and, and addressing that. These things have to be included in that circle. Yeah. And at least putting solar panels on nuclear power plants so if they lose power, they can keep running the generators with solar power because... It can work longer than, you know, after you have a, they found everything was wiped out. All the generators were wiped out. That was part of the big problem, mm -hmm. right? I think that if we're going to operate nuclear power plants, as many backup systems to make sure that there's not a power blackout at the plant is critical because we see at Fukushima what happens when the electricity gets cut to nuclear power plants. Yeah. Um, you, do you want to talk about your latest work? We just have a few more minutes. Uh, sure. You're about to publish, is that right? Or you're in the editing process? Yeah, I'm in the, the revision process. So because it has to go through peer review, it'll probably be one or two years before it's in print. But I'm finishing up a book that comes from my global Hibaksha field work, uh, where I was doing work all around the world and interviewing people in radiation-affected communities and soldiers and uh you know, there's been millions and millions of people whose health has been affected by radiation, either from production, from nuclear testing, or from nuclear accidents. And essentially, part of what my book argues, there's a couple of different things that the book argues. One is that um, we don't have any science behind the health risks to internalizing particles. So the people who are in situations like that, we tend to say that they're only at risk if the radiation levels are high externally. So I look at the way that that science and, and research came to be structured. But the main argument of the book is that the Cold War was a limited nuclear war. Uh, millions of people were harmed. Areas were left uninhabitable. Uh, it wasn't the giant nuclear war that we feared. We feared the Cold War would be this massive nuclear war, but it was a limited nuclear war. And we think it didn't happen because it didn't happen to us. But to people in the Marshall Islands, to people in Kazakhstan, the, the Cold War was an active nuclear war. Communities have been devastated with illness. Air, you know, whole communities and islands have been abandoned to radiation. And we have to look at this legacy and we have to recognize what we did. There were 2,000 nuclear tests in the Cold War period. So statistically, there was a nuclear weapon detonating every 8.6 days. Wow. Nuclear weapons are so big that you can't do that without having a massive impact on the ecosystem and on human beings. So this has remained invisible to us because the people this happened to are people we don't pay attention to. Right. So that's the, ba the basic argument of the book. So it's about uh, global racial and wealth inequality on many levels, right? Absolutely. And about colonial and post-colonial military policies. Yeah, I was uh, listening to one of your previous talks, and you were talking about um, getting students involved in local areas to document what's happening. Um, that <clears throat> seems more important than ever now, um, as you're unable to go and bear witness yourself and do research. Uh, do you have more of a network now online 
Um, not, not currently. This is work mm. that we did like about five or six years ago, and we and we don't have funding to continue it right now. But after this book, I'm hoping we can generate more funding. But part of the idea was that it, when we go, my research colleague Mick Broderick from Australia and I, who've done all of this field work, when we go to places like Kazakhstan or the Marshall Islands or Algeria or other places of nuclear testing, um, in a sense, we're kind of a last wave of colonialism. You know, we're white guys with microphones from someplace else that come in and say, please give me your story. And we take the story back and we have careers. So we're removing resources, too. And we were well aware of that dynamic from the beginning of our project. So we were always trying to think about how we can bring resources into communities instead of just remove resources from communities. And almost everywhere we went, one of the things we heard was that young people don't engage with this history. They think of this as their grandparents' history or their parents' history. So we began to hold workshops for young people from nuclear test site communities where we would train them how to conduct oral history interviews. So the first workshop was in the Marshall Islands on the 60th anniversary of the Bravo test, the worst test in the Marshall Islands. And we brought uh, college students from Kazakhstan, uh, from near the test site in Kazakhstan, college students from Hiroshima, and college students from the Marshall Islands. And for three days, we trained them. We didn't lecture about nuclear history or anything. We trained them how to conduct oral history interviews, how to record oral history interviews, how to deposit uh, recorded interviews. The idea being that instead of us white guys from someplace else coming in and having a translator tell us what somebody said, that people inside the community are gathering these oral histories in indigenous languages and through networks of family and neighbors, and that this would be a way to document a history that we would never be able to get as outsiders. So this was something that we, we held several workshops like this, and the idea was to try, first of all, to return some resources to communities, and second of all, to try to uh, help facilitate this work being done with inside communities instead of because scholars or journalists show up from someplace else. Wow, that's so interesting and so important. I hope you can get funding for that because I think it's going to be a while until researchers like you are able to travel and, and do things on the ground. So setting up these online networks is so important and the way forward, right? Absolutely. And part of the thing we wanted to do, too, was to introduce young people from these communities to each other so that they would have networks of communication between the test site communities. Previously, any contact between these communities was always at the elite level. Some uh, prominent person who spoke English, who could go to the United Nations and give testimony. And for people on the ground in these communities that just, you know, it seemed like something that didn't have anything to do with them. So having young people have friends in having people from Kazakhstan have friends in the Marshall Islands. Uh, it seemed like this, we, we hope that down the line, as these people moved into more positions of leadership in their communities, that they would have these resources that would allow them to operate more as a global community and less as an isolated community. Yeah. Thank you so much, Bo. We've gone yeah. over an hour. Ah. Thank you. We could definitely sure. talk all day, I think. You've you've yeah. got so much knowledge and insight, and I, I really appreciate the work you're doing, and it's so valuable to keep the discussion happening and have more transparency for all things um, nuclear. So thank you so much for everything that you do, and keep up the good work. Oh, thank you very much, Joy, and I can say the same back to you. Thank you oh, for the work that you're you. doing, bringing voices to the public, resourcing and networking, and keep up what you're doing. It's really fantastic, and we all benefit. Thank you so much, Bo. And if you're watching out there, thank you so much for tuning in, and please join us again at 5 o'clock. Uh, we have another speaker who runs at MPO in Tokyo who will be talking to us about the work that she does. Thank you so much, Bo. Have a good day, everybody. See you later. Take care. Bye.